You're listening to the Gold Standard Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympian and motivational speaker, Leah Amico. On this show, we're going to dig deep to unlock what it actually takes to build a foundation for greatness. If you're an ambitious person with big vision, but you feel like fear is holding you back, get ready for some major breakthroughs. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Gold Standard Podcast. Today, I have another Olympian on the podcast to share her story and how she is known as the comeback kid. She, as a child, as a student, had a learning disability, but she overcame that obstacle. She nearly lost her foot in a skating accident on the ice. She is a ice skater, a speed skater, and she beat all the odds that were placed against her, became a long track speed skater for the U.S. Olympic team in the 2014 Olympic Games. Welcome to the Goal Center podcast, Kelly Gunther. Thank you so much, Leah, for having me. Thank you for the intro. It was uh, was so amazing to kind of relive those moments and kind of go back down to the story where it all began. Yeah, I want to talk about how it began for you knowing that you had a learning disability, tell me a little bit about growing up with that. I know nowadays we hear so much more about it, but you know, and you're not that old, but I just know, you know, early on, I don't know, was, was there a lot offered to you? How did you deal with having a learning disability? Yeah. Um, well, first off, thank you so much for asking that question. Cause I never really like publicly talked about it. Um, honestly, until I made the Olympic team in 2014, um, I was something that was always really ashamed of it and more embarrassed of it, I think, because I always didn't really get the concept of it. You know, you're looking at the girl who never believed in herself, definitely didn't have the confidence. You know, I was set in this like little separate room, you know, off to the side. And I couldn't figure out, you know, why couldn't I just be like everyone else? Um, it took a lot of years and a lot of growth um, to be able to overcome that. And I think that's why I was ashamed of it more so like in middle school and high school is because I just didn't really know of how later in life, how proud I would be to be a special ed education student. And I say that because when I made the team, one of my special education teachers um, in high school had said, Kelly, just think of how many people you can help by telling your story. Let me mind you, I was 25 when I made the Olympic team and I was like, nobody wants to hear my story, you know, it's not going to help, but it did. And it did go back to, you know, being proud of that. And I had so much support through my school district um, because I had that learning disability. They really gravitated that I was that speed skater. You know, if I was my high school senior year, I think I was called the roller girl. And, you know, they're like, where are you off to this week, Kelly? Or, you know, why don't we see you? And I was always, I was traveling or, you know, this and that. So, something that I was so proud of um, to be able to come out and talk about it because, you know, I think a lot of kids struggle nowadays. Uh, And I still talk to my special ed teachers and I'm in my mid to late thirties. And I ask them, you know, still for help, like, Hey, I'm writing a speech. You know, can you just look over it? You know, talking to this audience, you know, does it pinpoint the audience that I'm talking to, you know? So it's something that has helped me way longer in the long run. Have you been able to talk to students and share your story? Do people come up to you afterwards and mm-hmm. thank you for that? Because maybe they can relate to you and see some hope in their situation. Yes, actually, my very first time that I ever spoke after I made the team, I went back to my high school in Clinton Township, Michigan. I had never spoke before. I had no idea what even came out of my mouth. I had just made the Olympic team a week prior. And I talked to the special education class along with the gym class, the local gym class there. And one of the girls had come up to me and said, you know, just from hearing your story, it has helped me so much. I didn't think I was smart enough to be a nurse or to be a hairdresser, but now I'm going to go back and keep doing it. And I think that's when my life changed. I think it was right there, right in that moment where I was like, I have to hold on to this. And a few long years later, it still holds a big part of my memory. I think it's powerful. And I think it will inspire a lot of people, whether people dealt with that you know, situation when they were growing up or now they have kids that do for me, I have three boys. And although my youngest is now 16, one uh, had ADHD, one had ADD. Um, my middle son was 10 before and, and I homeschooled him, but he was 10 before he really started reading 
fluently. He was, Mm -hmm. you know, smart. His comprehension was awesome. He could do the blends. He could see it when we slowed things down. But when we just said, okay, now go read, you know, he would just struggle with it. And it made him feel like he wasn't smart and it had nothing to do with how smart he was. But like you mentioned, that shame, that embarrassment, I think people look around and they try to do that comparison game. And so how did you learn not to compare and just to say, hey, I'm going to focus on what I want and start going after my own goals? Yes, absolutely. You know, for me, I really just gravitated towards skating and gravitating. You know, yes, it was hard for me, but I was good at this. You know, I may not have been the best, smartest, you know, student in the chair in the classroom by any means, but I could skate and and use that terminology, you know, of race and method, you know, how to be able to win that race, when to be able to go, when to be able to know my legs are going to get me to that finish line. I used that to my leverage as much as I could. And I used that to my power. And yeah, it was hard, you know, not to be like your typical everyone in high school, but you have to find out what you're good at and what you love. And I love skating. You were good at it and you loved it. And I think those two things are a recipe for success. And Mm -hmm. so you saying that, I agree. I fell in love with sports, soccer and softball at at a young age, but really like how you point that out because we should find out because here, if everybody started comparing themselves to you as a skater, (laughs) they're probably going to be way down on, you know, that pole and they're going to be a lot lower. So tell me, how did you get into skating? Yeah, um, I was actually, I was six years old. I was watching the 96 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. And mind you, as that six-year-old little girl, I had no idea what those Olympic rings meant, what they were. But I was sitting Indian style in front of the TV and I had said, I want to be on that stage someday. I want to do exactly what she's doing. Wasted no time at all. I was taken to the local roller rink the very next day. I was watching figure skate on ice. Um, I went to the local roller rink, as I had mentioned. So it's completely different from an ice skating rink. Did the figure skating, the costumes. I am your typical girly girl, girl next door. I love my hair and makeup. But I was a little too fast for the music and I couldn't hear the beat of it. And I always say, when you're a figure skater, skating to the music, you kind of need to hear the beat of it. So then I got introduced to inline speed skating. And at that time, I was probably seven, eight and still being that girly girl. I was like, you want me to give my costumes up and my hair and makeup to put on a helmet and, you know, a uniform. But, you know, going fast, turning left, it's taken me around the world 25 years later. And that's where it all began is literally at their local roller rink. <laughs> So, okay. So how did you know you were good at that? Were you really good right off the bat or did you just love it so much that you put all the time and effort into it and you grew over time? Yeah, I really think both of it, to be honest with you. So when I couldn't hear the the beat of the music, I think it was because when I was doing the spins, I would essentially just love to go fast and I would fall and get right back up and do it all over again. So I think that's why I just gravitated so much to going faster and turning left is because it was just a fit for masterpiece. So do you crash a lot when you're doing inline skating? So inline, you do fall a little bit more than I guess, like ice skating, essentially. Um, But typically I didn't fall too much now. Thank gosh. (laughs) So you were, you were good. All right. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, did that Olympic dream stay with you? You said at six years old, you started watching. I got chills when you said that I have interviewed many Olympians. I played with a lot of Olympians Mm -hmm. and almost every single one of them can remember that moment that they saw or heard and then said to themselves, I will be there. That was my, that was my situation as well. Once I knew softball was going to be actually an Olympic sport, I was like, I'm going to be on that team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's just something powerful about believing it and desiring it and being willing to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. So tell me how that shift eventually got you to the Olympics. Um, I love that question because you're not losing sight of it, right? Like, like we said, we had that dream at six years old or however young age that you are. And I kept that until I was going to be on that stage, no matter where I was, how I was going to do it. And I lived it and breathed it. I always kept it in the back of my mind. So to give you a little history, inline speed skating and is not an Olympic sport. So I did inline speed skating for about 13 years of my career, um, made junior world championships, world championships, 
Um, and they were in Colorado Springs, right? You, uh, I'm sure you know the mothership of Colorado of the sports and, you know, everyone getting to train out there. Well, inline speed skating, it not being an Olympic sport, we would still have our residency there. So we would live at the Olympic Training Center. And even then, in that moment, I was like, I want to go to the Olympics. I want to be a part of those Olympic rings someday. I love the dorm room. You know, I love the athletes. And then having that dream still live in within me. And when I graduated high school, I was 18, 19, and it was time to now learn a whole complete new sport and moving across from Michigan all the way to Salt Lake City. That's really the, I feel like the dream kind of started to begin because now is really on the road of the track to be, start to become an Olympian. Wow. That's powerful. And, and sometimes you got to make those changes. I'm sure there's stuff that goes into it. That's scary and hard. And like, this is so new, but you know, being willing to now talk to me about out, uh, I mentioned in the introduction that you nearly lost your foot in a skating accident on the ice. Mm-hmm. Tell me about what happened. Um, so this was kind of like a more so like devastating accident, I guess, sort of say. Um, 2010, I w- just made the Olympic team. Um, within 24 hours, I was being taken off by an Olympic team. My whole dreams had crushed ever since I was that little girl. Um, but the athlete that I was going to become was going to start right then and there. It was going to happen, me going back to that ice rink to practice the very next day. I knew I was brand new to the sport at that time. I'd only been doing long track speed skating for maybe about two and a half years at that moment. So I skated those, those Olympic trials to get the experience, my belt to see how it was, because no matter what, I knew I had another four years ahead of me. Well, two and a half months later, it, I had a double compound fracture. I was racing the 2010 last race of the season. I was racing the 500 meter and I'm not a true sprinter by any sort of imagination. So it takes me a second to get up to speed. I was, as I said, racing the 500, I just come off the starting line is in my very first crossover. And that day, my foot just wasn't steady enough in the ice and slipped out from underneath me. And because I raced long tracks, speed skating, you're in two lanes. So no one's in the lane with you. You're just in a lane by yourself and the pad system is next to you. So essentially my foot, when it got, didn't go in the ice, got stuck from underneath the pad and the torque of my body is what twisted it entirely off my leg. So I went from facing, going left into the corner to laying and sliding like a baseball, or I should say like a softball player into home base with my arms out in front of me and my feet up behind me. And I knew my leg was broken at that time. I just didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> so what happened when you got to the doctor and and did they tell you what the prognosis, what they thought it would be? Yeah. When I was laying there on the ice, uh, as I said, like I knew my foot was broken. I had no idea how bad it was, but I told myself in that moment, you know, Kelly, you can look once, but you can never look again. I looked and I turned around and I saw my foot my foot detached from my leg. Um, but I really focused on, to be honest with you, I never cried. I think I focused on more on how cold I was because I was laying on that ice. I'm sure I was in shock for a bit, um, but I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything until the paramedics got there because they said if they would have took my boot off, my whole entire skate off, there's no talent of my foot when I went with it. So in that moment, they just took the blade off and they couldn't take the, the boot off until I was actually in surgery. There was a lot of noise going on, but I do remember one thing that I had said on the way to the ambulance or on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, am I going to be able to skate again? And the paramedics, they always, they laughed and said, I don't know if you know this, but right now your foot's kind of hanging off your leg. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be able to skate again. And I think that's really kind of how it began too. So tell me about the process of healing afterwards and then getting back on the ice. Like, were you nervous the first time you laced up those skates again and thinking, oh my gosh, what if it happened again? Or what was your mindset? Yeah. Um, having my foot hang off my leg was probably the best blessing that I could have ever had. I always say if I could do it tomorrow, I would do it again all over. Um, I know it probably sounds crazy to the listeners, but it was honestly my favorite career moment because I had no idea what the road was ahead of me. The doctors had told me I would never be able to skate to the potential that I could have skated to. The Olympics are probably out of dreams and out of hype. Um, But a lot of you probably know um, Dr. Eric Hyden. Well, he essentially now is a doctor. He was one of the doctors in the hospital room um, who had worked with mine. And he had said, 
you know, Kelly needs to go to Colorado Springs if there's any way she can be able to come back and live her dream. And ever since I was that teenage girl, I wanted to live at the Olympic Training Center. So everything was happening for a reason. I'm a huge person that it all falls in how it's supposed to be. My first summer, I was there probably about five to six months, um, got to live there, got to experience it. Uh, not as essentially, I guess, as an athlete, I did all of my rehab there. I was not way um, weight bearing walked in um, with crutches and a boot. We had no idea what the road was ahead of me. Um, but I never missed a training session. Um, rehab became my training. I mean, I would be breaking down in sweat and tears, just trying to move my toes. Like it was a long road, but it was the best road that I could have ever had. I had the best doctors and team with me um, that got me back on the ice. And they actually a year later or a few months after that, when I was coming to my end of my road to be able to put my skate back on my feet, um, it was time to that million dollar question, right? Am I going to be able to skate again? I had already was seeing a sports psych for about two months. We had no idea if my foot was going to go back into a skate, but it did. Uh, so there's a little tiny hockey rink about maybe less than a mile down the street from the Olympic Training Center. And my whole entire entourage went with me, my trainer, my sports, psych, the head doctor, everybody, they Zamboni the ice. And they said, okay, Kelly, let's see if you can do it. Because they were not going to let me leave Colorado Springs to be able to go back to Salt Lake City, Utah, if I wasn't going to be able to skate again. We still had to keep going, but they let me graduate and I was able to keep going back to Salt Lake. Oh, unbelievable. Talk to me a little bit about support system because you just mentioned all of them that were there <laughs> helping you get better, talking to you about the mental side of things. Also your family. I mean, nobody gets to the Olympics without an amazing support system. So how important was that to you to be able to reach your dreams? It was so important. You know, it's not just you at that moment. It, it takes a village. So when I went to the starting line in 2014 of my 1000 meter, which is my bread and butter, I knew in that moment, I was not racing just for myself anymore. The night before I, had, I went and skated, I had said, I just kind of took a pause, you know, and said, whatever's going to happen tomorrow is going to happen. You know, I'm going to that starting line for my my doctor, the ones that put me back together in Salt Lake, all my sports, you know, med behind me in Colorado. My mom, you know, she has been there every step of the way, you know, ever since I was six. And it was that whole team, you know, that got me there. And so when I made that Olympic team, it was, it was for us. I think at that point, it wasn't just, it wasn't just for myself. So, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I can just Thank see you. the emotion behind it and how much yeah. that really, really meant to you. And I think that's powerful because it's bigger than you as an individual. Yeah. And then it means that much more. And also, you know, you're not alone. And, and I think mm -hmm. so many times we all want to strive for these huge goals Right. But it's hard because it feels like if I fail or it doesn't work out, what does that look like? And then am I letting people down? But then when you feel the support, it's also that extra push, yes. right? So tell me what you told yourself, because I'm sure there had to be some really, really hard days, hard days when you're in pain, hard days where as strong as you are mentally, that maybe you had questions. What did you tell yourself in those moments when maybe you wanted to give up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question, you know, because your mind is everything. And if you're not powerful in your mind, you're going to lose every single time. And I think it's a battle between you and yourself. It's a battle, you know, who is going to win? Are you going to let the enemy win? Or are you going to let yourself win? And in those moments that, you know, I was struggling in rehab is if I was going to be able to get back on, you know, my feet, am I going to be able to skate again? I will be honest with you. I never let that cross my mind. I saw those Olympic rings every single day. I lived it. I breathed it. And every night before I went to bed at the Olympic Training Center, non-weight bearing, I pictured myself walking into opening ceremonies. What is it going to look like? How am I going to be able to skate? Who is going to be there? You know, so I had just that strong mindset that I had fun with it because I had such a good support group around me that in seeing those Olympic rings, I don't know if I could have ever had a bad day, to be honest with you, because I was such... You know, I was just in my own little world, my own bubble with that huge support group. It was it was harder for me to go back to Salt Lake City than to leave my group in Colorado Springs because I had such a tight niche there that I had grown. And when you make that Olympic team and your team doctor is now sitting in the stands from walking in with my crutches, it that to me is my gold medal moment, you know, stepping on that ice and, you know, having him be there. And he had said after... Um, I was done skating. Here we are in Sochi, Russia, in the medical room. I'm sure you know, you can picture it. There's not much going on. And he had said, 
Kelly, I never told you how hard it was going to be, but I can tell you now this because you've accomplished it. You've lived your dream. You've never missed a session. And here we are. And, you know, it took that team, you know, of Karamity to get behind me, to push me. What a beautiful testimony and story Mm -hmm. and reminder. I think every person listening to this needs to think right now, like, Everything comes down to mindset. Everything comes down perspective. Everything comes down to where do you place your focus? Mm -hmm. What do you want? Are you going to focus on the problems and all the things that are keeping you from being great? Or are you going to keep yourself looking Mm -hmm. and seeing pictures? Or like she said, she saw the Olympic rings, rings and she visualized herself skating. And who was in the stands? To be able to have that visualization, that is the mind of a champion. That is why Kelly Gunther was able to almost have her foot to where she wasn't sure what was going to happen with it. It's hanging off of her, her body. And yet she's able to work her way back to being one of the best in the entire world and never once gave up on her dream. I I love that. You didn't let it cross your mind. That is something right now that tells me no matter what you do, Kelly, (laughs) you're going to change not only your life, yeah. You're going to change the lives of those around you because it is all about mindset. Now, the thing is, though, you can tell everybody what worked for you, but yeah. they have to do the work. They have to have the buy in. Yeah. But I'll tell you, any Olympian, any pro athlete, anybody that I talk to, their mind, even Taylor Dawkins, who I've actually interviewed on the Gold Center podcast, she was a, a college softball player, but in high school was diagnosed with liver cancer and has been fighting stage four going on seven years now as a miracle. Uh, The doctors really didn't even give her a chance. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, she's one of the most positive, hopeful, optimistic people I know. And that's in the fight for life. You know, we're Mm -hmm. talking about these fun things, but it doesn't matter. That's the great part is your Mm -hmm. mind is it can, it's, it's the best weapon or the worst weapon. You can harm yourself with it or you can help yourself and you can cut down anything that stands in your way from stopping Mm you. Wow. Kelly, that is so powerful as you share that. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about your mindset on the ice when you're racing. Do you, Mm -hmm. what you say before you start, are you thinking while you're doing it? Like, because I know as an athlete, an Olympic athlete, like as a hitter, when I go into the batter's box, like our goal is to keep our mind kind of clear as a defender, Mm -hmm. we might talk to ourselves a little bit more or we're vocal to our teammates. Tell me what it's like for you on the ice. On the race, it's really just going to align with your strategy. There's a strategy behind every single race because you're either a 500 meter skater to a 3k, which is a little bit longer, you know, so you're really preparing to, you know, where are you going to execute in the race? Where's your really go time? You know, this is you, you're, you know, who your pair is. So you kind of gauging that as well versus you're not just racing by yourself. Yes, you are, but you have to use that, that lane, that partner to, to kind of educate of, how you're going to feel once you're in the race, once you're going and that gun goes off. And I think you have to use that to your ability, but you have to have an open mind. You have to pump yourself up, you know, and to get yourself ready and to use, you know, your kind of cues. For me, like I had worked with a sports psych in color um, back in Salt Lake City, sorry. And for me, it was, I like to chase. So my partner would be kind of like a bunny and, you know, who's going to get there first? If this first, if she was a little bit ahead of me, okay, I knew I had to come out of the corners a little bit stronger, you know? So it's kind of, I made it fun. I made it a race and uh, you have to find the fun of it. It can't be too, too much. And because it's, if you overthink it, you've already lost the race before you've gotten to the line. That's great. Okay. So tell me a little bit when you walked into um, the Olympic arena, you tell me that you had visualized it before. Mm-hmm. Was it? the same as what you expected? Was it different? Give me some insight on that. Yeah, I think it was everything but more. You know, I've watched the Olympics ever since I was that six-year-old little girl. And, you know, just getting to hear the chanting of the USA, walking through that tunnel, standing there. I've dreamt about this ever since I can remember. And dreams do come true. Literally, you know, we walked it. You've been there. Um, you've had a gold medal around your neck. I unfortunately didn't get there. I have different, you know, stories to share with that. Um, but it was everything that I've ever imagined. And if you are just so proud of what you've overcome, who you've become, you know, wearing that representation of USA and just being so proud of all the hard work and dedication that you put in. So it meant a lot. Wow. And so few people get to experience it. And Mm -hmm. yet I really believe, um, if 
even Olympians and people that strive, they think I want to get a college scholarship. I want to be an Olympian. I want to be a pro athlete. I believe if they'll put in the work and the time and the dedication and, and make the commitment and make the sacrifices. And like you said, if they are the type of people that do things the right way Mm -hmm. and make those around them better then even if the outcome, because it's such a small number, right. And everything Mm kind of has to work the right way to get to that point. But even if it's not that route, I believe that they will have all that they need to be successful in whatever they choose to do. They're still going to end up in an amazing opportunity experiences. And they're going to be the type of person that every employer wants, or they're going to be the kind that go out and start the companies Mm -hmm. and they're going to find success because it really is those core characteristics. So tell me a little bit post Olympics. Did you have any struggle um, identity wise? Like now what? Because a lot of people have that. How was that for you? (laughs) Yeah, I laughed because I never thought I was that person because I was ready to retire. You know, I, I made the trials of the 2018 Olympic team. I missed it by one, um, but I was okay. I felt like the world was kind of lifted off my shoulders and it was my time to retire at that point. I'd already been skating for 25 years and my body was falling apart, but I think stepping away from a little bit and coming back to, you know, who am I? I've, I've always known skating, right? It's been very hard of a, of a learning curve to, to figure out, you know, who is Kelly on and off the ice, right? I'm so proud of this person that I've become and the challenges and the faces that and the obstacles that I have had to jump over. Absolutely. You know, but I want to be known so much more, you know, there's so much more on this side of, of Kelly. There's the girl who, who didn't believe in herself. There's the girl. Yes. Who has a learning disability. So for me, it's been a really hard balance to really metal tone that to a straight line of an arrow that, you know, I have imposter sy- syndrome, but get to know me as well than just, you know, Kelly, the speed skater too. How did you go from being that girl who doubted herself to then having so much strength and belief that you didn't even question that you were going to be back fighting for that spot on the Olympic team after a horrible accident? How do you remember how that shift took place or when it took place? Olympic trials, you know, really had a lot to play into that because I could have easily given up in that moment right then and there. I could have walked away. You know, I was new. I had made the team. You know, how could this be fair? I could have been a million reasons of why this happened to me. But in that moment, I knew that those Olympic ring still meant so much more to me. They meant that I wanted to be there. I wasn't going to give up right then and there. I'd always been a fighter and I was going to keep fighting. So I have I had to start believing myself because if you don't believe in you, no one else is going to believe in you. And if you don't put in the work, like as you said earlier, no one is going to do the work for you. I knew I had to be better, faster, and stronger to come back and make make that team because I was not going to be taken off by a ruling and I had to be fair and square at the end of the day. Uh, so having that as an early 20-year-old, you know, coming out of, you know, being a shadow, not always being first, I was always fourth, you know, finding that metal that like, Hey, I am Kelly. I need to believe in myself. It was something that was a huge game changer for me. And I've never looked back since then. It's good. And I think it's important for everybody to mm-hmm. be able to find what drives them and what motivates yeah. them and how they can build that belief. I, I find that a lot of people either um, just take it from their childhood and maybe that's just their insecurities, right. Or as they get older, like feeling like they're not going to measure up like fear of what other people think, uh, fear of failure. I think that's what, you know, keeps a lot of people, but anybody that I talked to that has really reached high levels of success, they were focused. It was the focus, right? Like I, that saying that is whatever you focus on grows. Well, when I'm focused on the goal that I want to achieve and the doors that I'm going to knock down to make it happen while someone else over there is focused on worrying about, you know, if they mess up and they don't want to mess up and that's what they're focused on, then you could see how, you know, things would get out of balance for them and you would have an advantage. I really believe, I mean, you know, what do they say? Like sports is, you know, 90% mental and 10% physical or something crazy. And it sounds crazy. Yeah. Right. Because what do we do? We work 
99% on the physical and 1% on the mental. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Anybody you talk to, I think it's changed a lot in all sports. You talked yeah. about talking to your sports psychologist in college. We were fortunate at Arizona to have one of the very few at that time sports psychologists mm -hmm. working with our team. And yeah. what he did is he found certain players visualized more. Others kind of were people that just had to build themselves up in their mind. Other mm -hmm. people had to physically do it and then they could, you know, see themselves doing it. And so being able to have that as an outlet as well in, as part of your support system is important. All right. So tell me, what are you doing now? What's the latest for Kelly Gunther? Yes. Thank you so much for asking that question. Now I actually work for Special Olympics Texas. The background for me just kind of came hand in hand, right? You know, just my own learning this building, my own personal grief with that, you know, overcoming to wanting to work with athletes and then sports, you know, I've skated for so long uh, and I wanted to be in that atmosphere where I could get them to live their dreams out, get them to, you know, go to their highest medal that they want to go to and their achievements, you know, whatever that looks like for them. How, how can I believe in them so that they can believe in themselves to know that you can't ever give up no matter what, what the road is ahead of you. And they always have a smile on their face, no matter what challenges that they're chasing. So I think a lot of times we think that we're teaching them a lesson and in all reality, they're teaching me a lesson because they're the ones with the biggest heart and the biggest smile on their face. Special Olympics is wonderful. Such a yes. great program. I love that the Olympics that we have, the Olympics or the Paralympics, and then there's also the Special Olympics. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know some gals locally that play uh, basketball and softball and they're constantly, you know, telling me, giving me updates about it. So it's, it's really <laughs> wonderful that you are giving back that way. Uh, tell me about your website and where people can find you if they, if they want to reach out. Yes, of course. My um, website is kellygunthersspeaker.com. Um, you can always book me there or find me there. I'm pretty present on Instagram. Um, I have an athlete page, Kelly Gunther on Facebook. Um, I do have a Twitter, um, just Kelly Gunther um, at the at sign. And that's, I'm kind of all over if you want to find me, um, but more present on Instagram. I think it's great that you're out there making a difference, not only in the lives of these Special Olympic athletes and sharing your story, but really just to encourage people because your story is very powerful and everything's about overcoming. We all have different things to overcome and some obstacles in some person's life might look totally different and they might think, well, wait, what I'm carrying is way heavier, but it doesn't matter. We all just need to keep running the race that's set before us individually. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing because to me, everything you've talked about really is the gold standard. It's how you do everything, how you carry yourself, the fight that you have, the mentality, the work you're willing to put in, the going after your goals and making them happen. So just, you know, is there one last thing from your story, your message, you've shared a lot of points that you just want to leave with the listeners today uh, for the, for the end of this podcast? Yes. Um, you know, always believe in yourself, never give up, no matter how hard the road is ahead of you. We'll sit here and smile and tell you it's not always going to be butterflies and rainbows. I can promise you that if you just listen to some of my story, but it does get better. You just can't give up and you have to have that goal and you have to have that de determination that you want it bad enough that nothing is going to stop you and you will get there no matter what. That's right. I love that message, Kelly. Nothing will stop you if you go after your goals and you don't give up and you keep believing and you keep working. That's it. You can't sit back and think things are going to happen. You got to put the work in, but when you do, you will break down barriers that stand in your way and you will reach those goals that you set for yourself. So thank you again, Kelly. It was such a pleasure and an honor to have you on the podcast and everyone listening. I hope that you really are able to take away a lot just about perspective and how when things go bad, she talked about her accident literally being the best thing that ever happened to her. I think she appreciated everything more and, and realized the work she was willing to put in and she overcame more than she ever had to. And so you can do the same, the hardest things in your life, you can actually turn them for good. So I hope that you all enjoy what you heard and we'll see you here next time on the gold standard podcast. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Gold Standard Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with a friend. You can post on social media and tag at Leah20USA or use hashtag Gold Standard Podcast. Make sure you also subscribe so you get notified each week as a new episode releases. You can subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. 
We appreciate your reviews as they help encourage others to listen in. Until next time, live out the gold standard and keep turning your goals into reality.